Welcome to Ability Assistance. My name is Phyllis Jones, Chair of the North Andover Commission on Ability Assistance. And my name is Stacy Leibowitz, Secretary for the North Andover Commission on Ability Assistance. This month, we are pleased to welcome Deanna Lima, Community Support Coordinator for the Town of North Andover. Welcome, Deanna. Thank you for having me. No, we're thrilled because as a commission, I think we are safe to say, we didn't even know your position existed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Many people say that, um, mostly because of the timing of right. um, the position starting. Um, I started the week of the gas explosions. So oh, that's there, timely, yeah. <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> there really wasn't an occasion to announce uh, right. my arrival. And since then, um, I've been quite busy, so there really hasn't been uh, much of an announcement. So well, yeah. here I am. <laughs> Gas explosion <laughs> and a pandemic, pandemic on yep. the heels of that. I'm yep. sure you've been quite busy. And, and then <laughs> in the middle of it all, we had the change in the town manager. Right, right. right. that's true. Yep. So yep. that, you know, that has, I'm sure, something to do with it. It does, yes. Yeah. So let's start a little bit about your background. Sure. Uh, so. My background academically, um, I have a, a master's degree mm -hmm. in community social psychology, which is uh, a little bit different um, than the, what you would typically think of psychology mm -hmm. to be. Um, community social psychology looks at understanding um, behavior and thinking, which is psychology in general, from the perspective of how community impacts individuals and how individuals impact community. So I've always had an interest in working at the community level, um, specifically working to uh, make, help make communities uh, stronger uh, from the perspective of prevention. Mm -hmm. So if you have a strong social support, a strong community, your, more of your needs are able to be met without having to turn to systems mm -hmm. and professionals. Um, and that sounds like very high mm -hmm. ideals, but I think we, I know, we've seen it in North Andover, um, very strong community mm -hmm. through all these crises. Um, yes. Community mm -hmm. very much Absolutely. taking care of each other. So, um, so my work has been focused on community level stuff. Um, I have worked a lot in the field of addiction, um, both prevention, um, education, intervention, all different levels. Um, I also spent many, many years teaching um, psychology mm -hmm. at UMass Lowell and Middlesex Community College. So I've done a little bit of everything. Um, so not everything, but done a lot. <laughs> right. um, also spent some time uh, working on various psychiatric crisis teams, mm -hmm. doing evaluations for people experiencing um, psychiatric crisis. So really all of my uh, work made this position um, the perfect one for me right. because it, it's a little bit of everything mm -hmm. um, and it's community-based. So it, it really was great for me. So when you started, walk us through, because obviously you started at a very um, erratic complex mm -hmm. time. And I mm -hmm. remember what this was like. That was quite a day. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, you, you, you and I were, yeah. <laughs> were talking <laughs> back and forth because her kids were home. Mm. I, we ended up all evacuating and going to the, the I think, football and, field and at the middle school. Your and apartment up. Com condo complex mm. is literally yeah. in the backyard of my so house. So it was oh, a wow. surreal experience. Mm -hmm. So here is your probably first real mm -hmm. um, situation to deal with. Walk us through what that was like and how you were able to support the community through that time. Yep. So a lot of that first year, the first six months was kind of just sit and wait um, mm -hmm. for you know in instruction on, on what to do and how to do it um, because what I had initially planned wasn't appropriate at right. the time. Right. Um, so that first year was a lot of supporting other departments, other staff in uh, making sure residents knew of the resources available to mm -hmm. them, um, making sure that we, the, the town um, was able to connect with residents mm -hmm. and make sure their needs were met. So most of what I did was really support um, those efforts um, 
along with other departments. Can, can you explain like what departments you were supporting and what efforts mm -hmm. you were able to help sure, them sure. put forth? Yeah, so for example, um, when there was funding released uh, to support folks mm -hmm. who were mm -hmm. impacted and the, uh, the, the town manager's office had the data on who accessed it and who did not, mm -hmm. um, we then uh, made teams and would go door to door for especially vulnerable populations right. um, and inform them, you know, this is available to you. Mm -hmm. Can we help you fill out the form? Can, you know, what's the barrier, that type of thing. Right, if um, there were language barriers right, or right. Um, elders yeah. who may yep. not, you yep. know, know what to do. Yep. So that makes yep. sense. So it was a lot of, uh, you know, stuff that was uh, mm -hmm. appropriate um, for my position, um, really connecting yeah. people with the resources. Um, there, there was a, a lot available and it was easy for folks to not know what applied to them, not know right. what they At were Which is to. typical whenever mm -hmm. there's any sort of, whether it be a disaster or any reason why mm -hmm. somebody might need a public benefit, mm -hmm. You don't know it's available mm -hmm. until, until you need until it, you need until it. You need it or <laughs> yeah. fall upon it as right. yep. we just did. Yep, yep. And the other thing that was um, I did a lot of in that time was people were obviously thinking, you know, this, this is going to result in a lot of mental health issues. Mm -hmm. And um, those that knew my position existed, so folks in the town administration, the school department, whatnot, um, we were all having a lot of conversations about mm -hmm. how mm -hmm. are we going to handle this? How will we, what can we provide right. um, to residents that are going to struggle with their mental health issues? Mm -hmm. um, so there, there were those planning kind of conversations for uh, moving forward in the future as well. Which I'm sure was a wonderful, um, for lack of yep. need or want, mm -hmm. a wonderful way to start up and be there for when the pandemic hit. Mm -hmm. At least right. you had some sort of a base mm -hmm. to work with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, uh, it was um, amazing to see the, and to c I continue to see it on a daily basis, mm -hmm. the way um, this community rallies when there's a need. Mm -hmm. it's, it's quite yes. amazing. I've always worked in larger cities, mm -hmm. um, and to see a, a small community be able to yeah. provide so much support on a regular basis mm -hmm. is really amazing. We're very yeah. fortunate here in we town. Are. Mm -hmm. We are. I was mm -hmm. very impressed by the, um, the reaction, the support, not even just locally. I have to say just, you know, even around the surrounding areas and into mm -hmm. New Hampshire, seeing yes. fire departments mm -hmm. and, you know, other resources coming in. So it it gives you a little bit of a sense of maybe not security, but knowing that there are people there to help mm -hmm. you through something mm -hmm. that you can't even imagine yes. happening. Yeah. So There's no way that I could um, do my job mm -hmm. if I didn't have the support of right. residents who mm -hmm. were willing to step up because there just aren't enough resources right. um, available mm -hmm. for folks in need. And you know, yeah. I have a lot of informal networks created uh, where folks will help out mm -hmm. in, in the unique needs that people encounter in their lives. Now, your office was originally located in mm -hmm. Town Hall. That's correct, yes. But you're now located at the North Andover Police Department. Mm -hmm. Correct. With an office opening or currently open also at the fire department. Uh, there, uh, so I have a brand new case manager. Mm -hmm. um, she's a social mm -hmm. worker. Crystal Clooney, and she spends time one day a week at the fire department, um, so quasi office there as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Yep. But you're a town for people who might be, for whatever reason, afraid of going to the police or the mm -hmm. fire department. Yeah. You are not a, an officer. You I are a town employee. That's correct. But you're still a first responder. That's correct. It's a very unique. Um, mm -hmm. It's a unique position that I hold, um, and the the position that I have, uh, a lot of cities and towns have similar positions. Mm -hmm. um, 
in response to the opioid epidemic, mm -hmm. they would hire folks to do follow up with individuals who've had an overdose or, or something of the mm -hmm. like. And um, those people are usually part of the police department um, and focus on the police department. In North Andover, um, it, this position was developed to be more comprehensive mm -hmm. and, and to mm -hmm. deal with all kinds of needs which I think is wonderful um, right. and, and really has uh, been, the majority of my work has mm -hmm. been in areas other than uh, substance abuse and addiction. Mm -hmm. Which is wonderful because you're not just in a narrow right. perspective, right. you're able to, right. to do more, to provide more services right. to well the community. Well, you're seeing the needs across right. the, yeah. the board. So the intent um, with having that broad perspective was to be in town hall, accessible mm -hmm. to all the public mm -hmm. and not have that relationship specifically with the police. But what, um, what we came to see is that people weren't necessarily comfortable walking into town hall either. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then when the pandemic hit, um, town, town hall, hall was, was closed. closed. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. And, um, Day to day, I was in the senior center with the food bank, mm -hmm. which, by the way, was an amazing experience and completely uh, stocked by donations from the community. Mm -hmm. And um, when it came time to transition back into it, when we weren't doing the food bank anymore, it became obvious that um, going back into town hall just didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And the benefit of being at the police department is connecting with officers uh, in real time rather right, than right. getting an email describing a situation mm -hmm. that could use follow-up um, there and, and we they can, can just the team comes door. together mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. and as far as being a, a first responder that's also a unique um, part of this position mm -hmm. because it allows for me and crystal as well to be out on calls mm -hmm. with the police and the fire and to have the, the same level of um, ability to assist and um, in the moment mm -hmm. and not have to um, deal with all the implications of needing to get permission right. for us to be there and to it's just it happens you're, you're naturally there if, if you're needed and if it's safe right. to be there right if it's safe of course right, right. Yeah. right. Yeah. so You've been doing that piece of it for the entire time you've been here, and so that would be three years, four years at this point? Uh, three, a little over three years. A little yeah. over three years. Yeah. And Makes you've sense. officially been a first responder the entire time you've been um, here? Well, it, it took some time to um, work out the, um, the MOU mm -hmm. and, yeah. and you know, the, all the legalities of that, um, and that probably didn't, start to like the second year mm -hmm. okay so it evolved because everybody or a lot of people mm -hmm. saw on the news this past year mm -hmm. about how boston put out this huge program mm -hmm. about <laughs> and we we had this discussion <laughs> mm -hmm. which is how i learned about your position because mm -hmm. i reached out to to chief gray and said hey, can we do this in town? And he's like, well, we already have this. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. But they put out this, this great program mm -hmm. where they had psychiatrists, psychologists mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. available to work with the police mm -hmm. so that if they're responding to a call and they're not dealing with somebody who's dangerous but needs assistance mm -hmm. because of their mental mm -hmm. health or right. their intellectual disabilities, mm -hmm. they have somebody there so that you don't have a police officer perhaps responding in a way that they wouldn't want to anyway, mm -hmm. given the situation. You're that person and right. you've been here since prior to the pandemic right. doing that. Right. So right. we've had that, that rollout since yeah, prior to great. Boston. Right. And, and I often chuckle when I see a news story <laughs> about another community um, rolling out this groundbreaking program. <laughs> that we're already and, doing. <laughs> and I think to myself, hmm, it kind of sounds like what I do. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's the more departments <coughs> that integrate yes. the different um, policing mm -hmm. approaches that um, benefit the community, the better, you know. And if they want to write an article about it, that's great. That's great um, yeah. But it doesn't have to be. Um, 
you don't have to follow a specific <coughs> model. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes departments do because they get funding uh, to implement a <coughs> particular <coughs> model. But in North Andover, we have been doing what works, and it's been working, mm -hmm. and it, it's been amazing. And people would be surprised at how much we do in North Andover that um, is unique to North Andover. So it's it's really great. Can you give us some examples? And I know you know protecting privacy, but mm -hmm. maybe some potential scenarios of how you and the police department and fire department have worked together over the past few years mm -hmm. to address issues that may have come up in the community. Mm -hmm. So um, with the police and fire, it's it can be something not urgent, not a crisis. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps th uh, they responded to a medical call mm -hmm. and noticed that a uh, senior citizen is in need of additional assistance at, at mm -hmm. home. So they will not call for us to go on scene, but mm -hmm. refer and say, could you check in with this person? Seems like they need more help. Right. Yeah. And then we take it from there. Um, all the way to the other mm -hmm. extreme where um, there is, well, a few weeks ago we had a couple of fires mm -hmm. um, yes. in one week and, and Crystal and I were able to be on scene and um, support the victims of those fires and begin to um, build a relationship with them and, and help connect them to mm -hmm. resources and, and help them get their needs met. Right. Um, there are also times where it's just um, helping somebody get through whatever the issue is that got the police in, in fire there. So yep. um, mm -hmm. unexpected deaths, families are obviously upset. Right. Um, so course. we're there to provide comfort. So it really, you know, runs the gamut. We also get a lot of referrals from other departments like the school department. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times even when a child has a lot of supports in place, there's still something missing. Mm -hmm. And the role that we play is kind of um, connecting all the dots. And, and we're right. able to do what the school can't do. We can go into a home mm -hmm. and we can see what's working and where the gaps are right. and what's needed. So we really do all kinds of stuff. Amazing now, service. can you also work with uh, the CPAC at the different schools? Um, so we, uh, we, I've been to their meetings and done mm -hmm. presentations and yeah. I mean so they know about your position in yep. case they have yep. something that yep. would be, they could use your services. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely, yes. No, that, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And you're there to just answer questions. Yes. You know, so what are the types of things that I as a resident could come to you and say, I need help with fill in the blank. What are yep. the types of yep. things? Well, uh, <laughs> I have to laugh because um, currently if you uh, call the non-emergency number at the police station, my e extension is the last one, so I'm the last choice. <gasps> so I get all kinds of requests. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know which other one to push, so. so yes, yeah, one. Exactly. So you can call me to find out if you can have a block party. <laughs> That is not an appropriate question. <laughs> um, I get uh, people calling to ask um, what they can do about conflict they have with a neighbor. Mm -hmm. um, oh, okay. A lot of times, especially in some of the um, uh, you, uh, apartment buildings, condos, yep. people have conflict, <laughs> they don't know what to do, how to handle it. Yeah. Um, a lot of calls from victims of domestic violence mm. who aren't ready to necessarily report it. Right. Right, but want to know what their options are for the mm -hmm. future. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, a lot of calls uh, inquiring about legal processes, um, okay. but not ready to actually go to a court and do something. Right. right. Um, so yeah, a lot, a lot of calls that relate to family issues. Um, and informational in yeah, nature. Yeah, like what can I do? My, my child is doing this. Right. Um, my, somebody in my family is experiencing this and mm -hmm. I don't know how to handle it. So 
now for referrals that you would make. You mm -hmm. would only make those referrals to government agencies um, or nonprofits, mm -hmm. I would assume, because speaking as an attorney, I would think that you know if you made a referral to attorneys if you needed something, that might be considered a conflict for the town. So just so people are clear, if I come mm -hmm. to you for a referral, you're not going to refer me to attorney Joe Smith. Right. You're, but you can refer me to um, well, like legal DCF aid or, or yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. those types of places. Yeah. And, and sometimes people um, do need referrals to um, private businesses like mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. an attorney. And in that case, I can connect them with other people who have used mm -hmm. services and um, they can provide information because as we were mentioning earlier, you don't know what's available until right. you need it. Exactly. And a lot of times, those types of services you need immediately. Right. Um, and, and don't have the ability to research yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Now, also, are you a mandatory um, first reporter? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, would it be fair to say if a 16-year-old girl came to you and said, I've been abused, I've been raped, are you required to report that or can she feel safe knowing that you're going to be able to, to take a step back and, and help her determine whether or not she even wants to press charges? So I am required to report that to mm -hmm. the Department of Children and Families, um, not to the police, not okay. to report mm -hmm. it as a crime. Um, and I think it's Usually, I don't, I'm not the person that makes reports simply because people get referred to me. Um, right, right. So, for example, if it were a 16 year old young woman, she probably would have come to me mm -hmm. through somebody at school or mm -hmm. somebody else. And, and they and might have already reported the right. situation. Right, mm -hmm. right. That, that person would have made the report okay. and she would be coming to me because of that. that. Okay. Yep. that because my, my only concern with that is you might have somebody in that age category who needs mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. but is afraid to report it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's their father, it's their brother, mm -hmm. it's you know, right. somebody well, fear for their safety. Exactly. Mm -hmm. exactly. I actually feel like um, people people need to talk. Mm -hmm. yes. And um, when they have that opportunity, they take it. So right. I, I feel like it hasn't been an issue. Um, people need to talk. Yeah, no, that's I get that. That's yeah. fantastic. And I guess to that's know. A, a good segue. Thinking of people who need to talk and issues. Talking about the pandemic, which is an ever mm. ongoing situation. I yeah. mean, granted, we're knock on wood in a little bit of a better space right mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. uh, coming out of Omicron, but we still don't know what the future holds. So it's been a a very tough two years for people. Mm -hmm. Speaking of mental health concerns, people yes. looking for resources and needing to talk. What has that process been like working with um, residents uh, around that? Because I'm sure you've gotten calls mm -hmm. and requests for, for help in different areas. Yes, so it's been fascinating to see the trajectory mm -hmm. um, over time. Initially, the news um, w would have so many stories about right, right. you know the emotional toll this mm -hmm. is going to have but immediately that wasn't the case because people were focused on basic needs right. you know Survival. I lost my job how am yeah. I going to feed my family mm -hmm. um, and and we really saw that even here in North mm -hmm. Andover and, and that's when we um, started with the the food bank mm -hmm. yeah. once that subsided with the first kind of lull that's when we began to see some of the social, emotional, mental health issues. I, I can honestly say I wish I had known about your position because, you know, as many people are aware, mm -hmm. my, my son, who at the time was in the seventh grade, you know, or no, sixth grade, he was still in the sixth grade when the pandemic hit, mm -hmm. he spent most of the seventh grade in and out of the hospital mm -hmm. for mental health reasons mm -hmm. associated when he was ill back in the third grade yeah yeah you know with PTSD and, and issues mm -hmm. 
regarding being in a lockdown mm -hmm. and, and not yeah. being able to process that it wasn't just him this time. Yeah, and I worked with so many families who um, had children with either mental health or behavioral mm -hmm. health issues and their conditions were exacerbated by, yes. by that. Of and course. the traditional routes that they would take to stabilize their children we're not weren't there. available. Yeah. Correct. Um, so then it would become um, a bigger issue mm -hmm. and in some cases would end up in a police call because mm -hmm, yep. you might have a child running away, right. you might end up with aggression um, mm -hmm. and, and some physical acting out. So, so many families were, mm -hmm. were in that position. Mm -hmm. So, you know, once we started to um, see see the emotional impact, then the calls became more um, out of exasperation mm -hmm. and desperation. Yes. And that, that was so much harder and continues to be so much yeah. harder because there just aren't enough resources. Yeah, and yes. I, I can definitely elaborate on that with, you know, I work for a disability services organization. We were talking yeah. off camera earlier mm -hmm. about staffing issues mm -hmm. and also people not being able to and I, I work with the adult population mm -hmm. but it's similar with those who are under 22 or under 18 where mm -hmm. you have um, people who've been in lockdown people who have been in residences mm -hmm. or in their own homes they've been they've gone home to families and you have individuals on the autism spectrum yep. uh, and other uh, developmental challenges who are regressing yes. and we have not been able like so many agencies to bring everybody back mm -hmm. so people are still struggling and it's a real day-to-day -day safety concern it's an emotional concern mm -hmm. you know having a resource yeah. like you is is critical it may not solve the issue immediately but if there are resources or something that a family is not aware of that may help them right. it, it's a, a critical uh, time and resource for them to yeah. help we have some very um, unique well, not unique. There, there are some um, very identifiable groups in mm -hmm. the community that um, have been especially impacted, and yep. those are uh, seniors who are normally yep. isolated um, yep. and, and have less ability to interact. Uh, we have children who started school right. yep. remotely during a pandemic mm -hmm. and missed that whole experience social. of socialization. Yep. Um, and then we have the young adults who transitioned yep. from high school and had, in a lot of cases, finished high school mm -hmm. without, you know, the normal, um, the, the normal social stuff. Right, the graduations, my, yeah. the proms, yeah. Yeah. and yeah. My the saying goodbye to... same thing, yep. you know? Yeah. And yeah. Um, a lot of parents reached out because kids didn't adjust well to college mm -hmm. remotely. Oh. Yeah. So we've got these three groups that really struggled with their development, mm -hmm. you know, the, these yep. normal developmental stages because of the isolation from the pandemic. Of course. And um, that's just not even thinking about the other stuff, mm -hmm. like yeah. the illnesses, the you know, financial issues. So it, it really has impacted folks on so many levels. Mm -hmm. Now you talked about, um, and I'd read this in the article, there was a recent article published about you and your office, mm -hmm. about putting together some sort of a um, support network for mm -hmm. the high schoolers mm -hmm. or for young mm -hmm. adults who are transitioning mm -hmm. from a high school mm -hmm. perspective to yeah. either college or moving on with their lives mm -hmm. into a professional setting. Yes. So, um, as I mentioned in the beginning of our talk, I really believe in, in the power of community and mm -hmm. people coming together and support groups um, are a very effective tool for folks um, mm -hmm. in their journey to feeling better. Um, <clears throat> so it is a, a plan of mine to um, initiate support groups uh, for young adults um, and for seniors. and, and there's a need yes, for, for, course, for, every yeah. <laughs> for, for everyone. Or even a parent <laughs> yeah. who is dealing with 
or you know, having concerns with a child mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or another loved one that they've been caring mm -hmm, about mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where the parent needs the support. Right. So yeah. another group that um, is close to fruition is um, a support group for parents um, who have difficulty parenting their children mm -hmm. because of uh, uh, some diagnosis or mm -hmm. some behavioral issue or, exactly. or something that um, is, is a challenge mm -hmm. in some way. Yeah. So yeah. that they know they're not alone. Yeah. Right. I think being in that caregiver role is more challenging than sometimes people realize. Yes. Mm -hmm. So they are definitely mm -hmm. on the list of people. You have those who, yes, the children, the, um, you know, the adults that have challenges, mm -hmm. all those transitional changes, mm -hmm. but what happens to the caregiver in the process, especially right. with COVID. So I think that, uh, that'll be a great group to have. I'm mm -hmm. sure that it, it will be lively because many times people just sort of get into that tunnel vision and then they hit a mm. wall at some point. And I always feel um, really sad for folks who mm -hmm. are in that position. I experienced that, mm -hmm. you know, with my children and you feel isolated, lonely. Mm -hmm. And now the folks that I speak with in the community, they really feel like they are the only ones. Right. And they and they're can't. Not. And, and they're, they're not. not. <laughs> and and I tell them, trust me. Yeah, you are not <laughs> You're alone, not but you alone. feel like it. <laughs> tell someone yeah. and they will tell you they have the same experience. Yeah. But even now there's so much stigma still yes. around mm -hmm. mental health issues yeah. and behavioral issues and Which and I really thought that um, a positive impact of the pandemic if any, would be that uh, we're more understanding mm -hmm. of the importance of mental. I think mental people as a whole mm -hmm. yeah. are more understanding, but there's still the stigma mm -hmm. involved. Right. right. And, and, and that's I the think fear. part of it is generational. Yeah, it's generational mm -hmm. and that there's a fear yes. connected to mm -hmm. that because even though there is more understanding in society about it and there is more support, it's there's still that because of how you were raised, yep. the generational right. pieces, but also internally, you, you've made that such a part of, well, there's something wrong with me. Right, right. And so people mm -hmm. are still, even if the support is out there, unfortunately, people are still afraid. Mm -hmm. Am I gonna get fired from a job? Right. Am I, right. my family gonna turn away from me? So having a resource like this, mm -hmm. um, among other resources, to let people know, no, it's okay, we've mm -hmm. got your back, and there are others like you. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that to know that you're not alone is, is a huge comfort for people. It so. is. Speaking as somebody with, yep. you know, with a son who, you know, like I said, he, he's going through, um, you know, he's de developed, turned back. Mm -hmm. um, on regress. Where, pro regress. Regress, yeah. thank you. Um, on where he had been, you yeah. know, before the pandemic and slowly trying to build him back to right. where he mm -hmm. was, mm -hmm. you know, um, I have a phrase at home when people are like, Phyllis, you need to stop and take a breath. My thing is, oxygen is overrated. <laughs> <laughs> but you're in that caregiver role. But I'm yeah. that caregiver yeah. role. So, you know, I know that there are people out there. I'm obviously not afraid to discuss it. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm happy to put it out there and say you're not alone. Mm -hmm. But I personally could you know, use a group like that mm -hmm. to remind yeah. me that, you know, yeah, oxygen is really a good thing. It's not overrated. Right. You can right. breathe. You have to right. take a breath. And, and yeah. I understand it too, being a sibling, because mm -hmm. I have a younger sister who has a developmental disability and a mental illness. Uh, and she, she lives one town over. Mm -hmm. She's mm -hmm. very high functioning, very independent, but she also regressed mm -hmm. uh, quite a bit during the pandemic, especially the first few months. And as a, a caregiver, in that respect, it was very, very challenging for mm -hmm. me. So I, I get that side of it. But of course, you, you put that that hat on of, I have to do this. I, I can I do everything. Mm -hmm. yep. I mm -hmm. can handle it. But it was so hard watching her and knowing because we couldn't really see each other. Mm -hmm. you know. And she's doing better, but the anxiety remains. Mm -hmm. And so trying to get more services and help for her. And then I stop and think, because I run around you know, oxygen is overrated yep. type of thing. And, and my husband is just like, you have to take a step back. You just mm -hmm. don't think about it. And I, I, I really think as a caregiver, we're really at risk mm -hmm. because, you know, you just sort of take it for granted that this is the role you're in, mm -hmm. this is what you do. And so then there's that burnout factor. Mm -hmm. So it's, 
I think it's across the board that COVID has really, I, I hope like you that it's changed, mm -hmm. you know, that, that image of what mental illness is because what is it like one or in four people mm -hmm. have depression yes. just even before the pandemic, yeah. I'm sure that's higher now, yeah. but that's, that's an important thing to get out there that everybody's really at risk as a result of this and situation. I was reading a study, I don't know if either one of you saw this in the press the mm -hmm. other day, but there was some neuro studies done where how it changes your exactly yeah. even people who you might use the term yeah. normal for yeah. I hate the term but but you know it's a term that people understand exactly how neurologically the pandemic even if they weren't ill you know even right. if they were completely safe because they were locked away by mm -hmm. somebody with other people to care for them right. that neurologically people just changed mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the possible long-term effects of that 10, 20, 30 years yeah. down the road. We mm -hmm. don't know. We right. don't know. And right. so having so. somebody like you in, mm -hmm. in place and then hopefully, you know, constantly morphing that position where mm -hmm. you now have somebody assisting you mm -hmm. as we learn mm -hmm. more, mm -hmm. we're able to, to make sure that people have the resources available right. to them. Mm -hmm. We, and we need more resources. Yes. Um, yeah. y you can have 10 community support coordinators. It's still not enough. <laughs> but if there aren't resources yeah, to exactly. refer folks to. But you're also a fantastic resource to folks like us, the commissions. Right. And, mm -hmm. and right. I mean, we got, an, or I got an email from um, Christina Minicucci, uh, mm -hmm. one of the state reps here, mm -hmm. talking about she had read an article you know, and this goes back to another one of first, you know, for family givers, you know, who get scared. You know, mom was always concerned. She had an autistic son and she was always concerned mm -hmm. that, well, what if there was an accident or what if mm -hmm. I got pulled over mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I was unable to, you know, speak so that I could communicate with whoever showed right. up. Right. that my yeah. child is autistic and mm -hmm. perhaps maybe the lights on the police cars mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. you know certain levels of voices whatever that trigger could be for mm -hmm. that individual yeah. what do i do right. you know i want to see these these cards similar to what um, people who are deaf or hard of hearing mm -hmm. have where they can point to something yeah. and, mm -hmm. and communicate that way and you were right on top of it you know you looked into it mm -hmm. you've found an AWARE program to provide even more training. I know mm -hmm. that our, you know, our police and our fire have been trained significantly, but we can always have even more mm -hmm. training. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but then you found a law in Connecticut where there's something similar to that mm -hmm. already in place. And we've sent that to our legislative delegation. And as you know, they've picked it up and they're moving with it to try to get it right. through the mm -hmm. state house. We're mm -hmm. very fortunate. We have a very yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have a very strong delegation. <laughs> we do. We do. You know, do. here in town. But, you know, for me to be able to say, "Hey, what do we got?" Right. And to be able to work with you, mm -hmm. right, and have the emails back and forth and talking and and bringing it back, you know, now because of your research, we may be able to implement something in the state. Mhm. Mm and all it started with was an email from right. me mm -hmm. that I got from Christina. Right. And, and that's, I think, a perfect example of um, really the, the possibilities with this exactly. job. So I can um, work with one family mm -hmm. who's concerned about their child mm -hmm. and their child's needs. And I can alert the police department and the fire department and say, hey, if you ever respond to this address, right. make sure you know. Be aware. Right. Be, Be aware. aware. Um, so that's taking care of that one person's need. However, there are so many more people. There's more. Yes. You right. can expand on it. Right. So uh, there's clearly a gap. Mm -hmm. um, people have this need, but we don't know how to address it on a, a community mm -hmm. level. And I can't even imagine you have the, the child, we'll take mm -hmm. that example of the child who is so negatively impacted by a situation mm -hmm. because mom or dad or, you know, older sibling can't communicate effectively because mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. situation. And then you have a first responder who's doing his or her job. Mm -hmm. And if they had only known, right. they would have reacted right. differently. Right. And now they're dealing with their own mental health right. crisis mm -hmm. trauma. because they don't want right. to 
Right. They don't want to make the situation worse. Right. They want to help it. Right. So, uh, you know, putting a program in place um, in this case mm -hmm. can prevent something going mm -hmm. wrong yes. where a, a child or, a, you know, an, an individual um, is triggered and mm -hmm. their behavior is potentially misunderstood right. and things go in a direction they don't need to go in um, where we can implement a program that very easily, once implemented, yes. can cut back the support. on, on the yeah. possibility and, of that And happening. your brainchild of finding that yeah. could actually help the entire Commonwealth, right. not well, just, well, no, <laughs> it could, it could. But, but there here's could be the some thing. expansion on that. that. That's, that's exactly, if the state legislator is able right. to do mm -hmm. what we have, you know, suggested to them and they mm -hmm. want to, mm -hmm. but also when I reported to the select board and told them about mm -hmm. how I was working with you and, you know, more services available to the police department mm -hmm. so that they can be, you know, more understanding mm -hmm. when they go into a situation, they were also receptive to that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. we're, you know, people, not only can you help us, but people want to help you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. help mm -hmm. the people mm -hmm. who need the help. It's, it's a strong connection, and I also think in terms of the police department and fire department, but particularly police because of everything that's been happening mm. in the world mm -hmm. yes. over the past few years, this is also a way to build more trust between the community mm -hmm. and the police, mm -hmm. knowing that this resource exists, that maybe people don't have to be afraid that, well, if we call the police, something bad will, will happen, happen. Right. even yes. though we need their support. But knowing that you've been involved as this connection, excuse mm -hmm. me, uh, makes a huge difference because then that trust can be built. Right. They know what the situation is with right. their child, so right. they can feel safe in having the police come, and that we can continue to build that trust and work together as a community. And that's um, something I do quite frequently. <coughs> if um, I'm working uh, more long term, mm -hmm. uh, an ongoing relationship right. with a family, and we know that the family member that may have um, the mental health issue is struggling and not stable, mm -hmm. I'm able to report that back to um, the police and say, hey, if you respond to a call at this home, know that this person is not at their baseline. Right. Um, you know, know that this is the situation that's happening now. And the police are so responsive and so appreciative mm -hmm. to know right. what they're walking into. So it's a great system. Um, but who would want to voluntarily call the police and say, right. hey, I've got problems in my house. Right. And but exactly. this takes that stigma afraid. out of yeah. it. It yeah. takes yeah. the stigma yeah. out. Well, Deanna, it has been just a pleasure having yes. you here Thank today. You. Yes. And um, we're so grateful to have this resource in our community. And to be able to build this relationship yep. with you yep. so Thank that you. we can we can help the community help you help the community. I appreciate Easy that. Said. <laughs> <laughs> what she said. <laughs> Took a moment to kind of find you one. at the, the North Andover Police Department. Absolutely, yes. And, and you do work normal business hours for Town Hall. However, I've noticed on your business card, you are available. So if somebody has an issue, you mm -hmm. are available, whether it be they're calling the police to get help, right. the police can mm -hmm. reach out to you. Correct. Or somebody in the community who needs right. help on a Saturday or a Sunday. Right. So if there's a, an emergency situation after hours, mm -hmm. um, the um, first responders, so the dispatch team knows how to reach me um, for emergency situations, yes. That's good to know. Wh which is good to know because yeah. it then goes back to you know, Boston has more resources than we do because mm -hmm. they're a huge city, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, but we actually have the program in mm -hmm. place mm -hmm. for the 24 yeah. hour, mm -hmm. even though you're not literally on 24 right. hour. Right, right. But I do respond for emergencies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Understandable. Mm -hmm. Understandable. Mm -hmm. None of us can be on 24 7, 365, <laughs> even though a lot of us try to. Right, right, right. <laughs> Thank you again. Yes. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. It's been a pleasure. On behalf of the North Andover Commission on Ability Assistance, thank you again, Deanna, Community Support Coordinator for the Town of North Andover for joining us on Ability Assistance today. You can reach Deanna directly by phone at 978-794-1703
or on her cell at 978-989-1048 or through email at dlima, D-L-I-M-A, at N-A-P-D dot U-S. In March, our guest will be Joe LeBlanc, North Andover's District Director of Veteran Services. In April, our guest will be Perkins Career Launch Program. This is a brand new program. Exciting. And in May, we will be celebrating our 25th episode <laughs> of Ability Very Assistance exciting. with our guest, Four Paws for Ability. And to finish off our 2021-2022 season, our guest will be our new town clerk in June. She'll be Dawn Warren. We are consistently looking for new topics to explore here at Ability Assistance. If there are specific topics that you'd like to learn more about, please email me directly at pjones, that's as in Phyllis Jones, at northandoverma.gov. We would like to thank all of our volunteer crew from the Greater Lawrence Technical School and Curry College. From the Greater Lawrence Technical School, from Graphic Communications, we have Cassie Bruano, John Cor Corfi, sorry, <laughs> from IT, Alan Garcia, and from, from Curry College, our own Carly Jones. Thank you so much. And in addition to watching through your cable station, you can catch all of our programs on demand via YouTube, the Cablecast app on Roku and Apple TV, and North Andover Cam's website. And we also always roll out these shows via podca podcast on Podbean. Until next month, 